the 11th episode of the Chat Chamber podcast by RGSL, we welcomed Martin Krugier, who is a Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales. The episode covers the principle of rule of law, the values of liberal and illiberal democracies, as well as authoritarian regimes, the role of each person in political systems, power, as well as Martin's peculiar interest in Central and Eastern Europe given his past. This episode was developed in collaboration with the webinar series Spring with the Rule of Law in Central and Eastern Europe by the SWPS University of Social Sciences and Humanities. I see that we are both surrounded by books. We are, we are, we are. That's, Symbol uh, of knowledge, isn't it? That is, it's an occupational hazard. We are very glad to host Martin Krigier, who is a professor of law and, soci and, and soci sociology, as I understand, right? Social theory. Social theory. Social theory. So, in a sense, uh, your main interest is, of course, how law and how people interact with law, in a sense, and, and uh, as well as many, many uh, multidisciplinary aspects. So, you teach at uh, the University of New South Wales. Well, I no longer do much teaching. I have graduate students, but I don't teach undergraduates. Uh, and I have a sort of roving brief. I can do what I like, which is a nice way to be. And until COVID, uh, my main uh, lecture teaching in, for the last few years have been international um, intensive courses in Warsaw, in Onyati, in Israel, uh, where else? I think that's the and yes, they're the main places. Do you see some difference of uh, how people look at law uh, at these different places, or is there some kind of a fundament that everybody share? No, I think it's very different, uh, and it's different, particularly because of I'm not a once upon a time I. Th I think I thought of myself as a lawyer, but that's a long time ago. And so my interest is really political and sociological. How does law affect things in the world? And in particular, because um, my political interests were always in uh, despotisms. I was fascinated, horrified, but fascinated with despotisms. My parents had come from... Poland, as you probably know, and uh, they were refugees from Nazism, and then they couldn't go back because of communism. And I was uh, living in this sunny, it's still sunny, even though it's 6 p.m., in this sunny country with relatively few and simple problems compared to the worst that the world has to offer. And at a certain point, I just uh, couldn't understand when I heard about totalitarian countries and more, more generally tyrannies. And I became obsessed with it. And that was when I was around 17. I hadn't done much else. Um, so that was long before I had any interest in law. And then by a series of accidents, my doctorate was not in law, it was in intellectual history, and it was on Marxism and bureaucracy. So it was on Stalin, Trotsky, Lenin, as well as Marx. Not out of, it was not a labor of love, but it was a kind of obsession. And then by accident, oh, in between, <laughs> in between I'd studied law, uh, but I didn't, I found that pretty boring. And so I left that behind. And it was an only an accident that I got asked to teach jurisprudence, philosophy of law, at a law school, and I started that because I needed a job. I was young man who was just married. And uh, I found it quite interesting, but it left out a lot that had interested me before. That is the connection with politics. And then um, first I had gone just on a, for a few months, for a few, few weeks actually, to the United States where I met grand old man of Lawrence sociology, the name of Philip Selsley. And I thought he was wonderful, partly because he had 
though he was always American, he was the son of refugees who had come from Russia and Romania at the turn of the 20th century. He knew the score. He knew the sort of things that I was obsessed by. But he was a very sophisticated thinker. He was a great subsequent. So that sort of fertilized an interest in sociology and connected it with law. And I kept thinking, what I'm learning in doctrinal law doesn't tell me how law is working in the world. And then when communism collapsed, I was terribly excited. I already gone <laughs> twice to Poland. Uh, in 85 and 89, and I was very engaged, uh, you know, as, as engaged as a person can be from Australia. Uh, and I was terribly excited, and I thought, this is a transition, and it is a transition to democracy, and rule of law is very important. So I was really very closely associated or connected or interested in rule of law promotion. And then... It seemed to me, first of all, it wasn't working that well. In a lot of countries I looked at, uh, one of the countries I've spent a bit of time in is Myanmar. But I also wrote about other countries, Afghanistan, though I wasn't there, uh, where there was an enormous amount of money and effort devoted to developing the rule of law, but without much success, to say the least. And I kept thinking uh, there... There's something wrong intellectually here. It's not just that it's hard, which it is, to develop the rule of law. But people aren't thinking about it adequately. And there these two parts of my life connected because law and society studies keep telling people, don't take the image of the world that you get from the doctrine to be the way that law acts in the world. Law in books, law in action, you probably know that cliche. And they also said there's a long distance between, say, the writing of legislation or the work of a court and whatever is happening in the world. But surely, I thought, the rule of law matters in the world. And so that developed, this is a terribly long and indirect way of answering your question, but it developed my sociological critique, partly sociological critique, of the way people looked at the rule of law. And uh, one part of it, and now maybe I'll put myself back into your question, one part of that is that uh, when I looked at problems in Myanmar or problems in various countries where people were confidently trying to promote the rule of law, I thought you the context is maybe not everything, but huge. So unless you know that context and build up from it, instead of the way promotion does, we have this model, rule of law requires an independent judiciary, this, that, and we bring it to you, we sell it to you, we train people up, uh, you're bound to go wrong. Even though I'm not at all confident that I know how to go right, I thought that there were these mistakes. And so to come back to your question, contexts matter hugely, but if they do, doctrinal law can only take you some distance from understanding what's going on. It's not that it's unimportant. It is important. But it can't tell you the whole story in any country because the way that law interweaves with life is very different. One thing, for example, when I was studying Poland before I ever went there, I read that there is an expo- a Polish expression, or maybe it's the expression of the woman that I read it from, an American specialist in Poland, Jane Curry. She said, Poles live around the law. And, you know, Australians don't live around the law. Of course, a lot of people do, but not normal people. Or then I heard this Bulgarian saying, law is like a door in the middle of an open meadow. Field. I mean, of course, you could go through the door, but only an idiot would bother doing that. Why? Because we don't know what's on the other side, because um, it's not for us, it's for other sorts of people. There are all sorts of things. And so my fascination with law is not a lawyer's fascination. It's not an insider's fascination. 
it's an outsider's fascination with how law manages, if it does, to make a difference, and what sorts of differences it makes, and that varies. And sorry, this is so far from what you asked. I don't know. No, I think this is very. I think this <laughs> is very valuable. Safe. I think this is very valuable for the for the fact that it really uh, shows how you have developed your your interest in law, and that it's not only about the you know how to say the words, the letters in that paper, but it's about why those letters are even there. And, and yes. how do people understand these letters? And, and I think that... What's that the distance the between the two? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. I've emphasized the sociological component. I've always uh, been a kind of interested or driven by p concerns of political morality. So it's not... I'm. I mean, you've got to explain, and I bow to people who are good at sociological explanation, but I'm, I think, mainly driven, or at least at the back, is this concern of political morality or political theory. When does law screw you and when does it help you? Matters. And what is the answer? Sometimes it screws you, sometimes it helps <laughs> <laughs> as many things in life. Well, I wanted to ask. Uh, well, you you mentioned just uh, you know like this political theory aspect of law, and then and wouldn't you say that the rule of law, which is one of your expertise, is inevitably tied with uh, with the political theories of liberalism because we understand that the rule of law is not only that there is this law that in a way prevails in a society and not specific individuals and their interests, but it's more of a systemic approach to that. But even, even if there is the rule of law and not rule by law, there is always some kind of intrinsic values, intrinsic uh, morality in that, uh, which, uh, which is not perhaps uh, explicitly said in the book. So, in your opinion, what are the values and the ideology that, under, that in a sense, underlies in the rule of law? It's an excellent question. Uh, I've tried recently to write, I've done a piece on the rule of law and democracy and another piece on illiberalism and the rule of law. And particularly in the second piece, your question was central. Uh, I think there is an intrinsic collection between rule of law and liberal political values, which, after defining them, are my values, but it's not every sort of liberalism. But there are two points I want to make. First, the ideal of the rule of law is older than liberalism. There weren't liberals before the 19th century, but there were for a very long time people who said it. The people with the power should be limited or don't screw us uh, constantly with your law and your power, etc. That's very old. It's in Aristotle. Nobody would say that Aristotle was a liberal. It's in Locke, okay, so he's a proto-liberal. It's in Montesquieu, uh, even though the word liberalism wasn't invented, but, of course, Montesquieu had a big effect on liberalism. So, I think that I, the reason I make the point, one, I think it's true. <laughs> it's a good idea. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of people say in, in Poland now, Hungary now, particularly Hungary because Orban has been quite explicit about this. He says we're Democrats, but we're not liberal Democrats. We're, ours is an illiberal state. He said said that publicly. And so he and many people try to associate the kinds of ideas of liberalism that I was talking about last night or that several people who were in the panel or in the audience, Dzhikovsky, the judge of the Polish Constitution, ex-judge of the Polish Constitution. I always wonder whether when I call him an ex-judge of the Constitutional Court, I'm saying He's an ex-judge of the Constitutional Court, or he's a judge of the ex-Constitutional Court, given that there's no Constitutional Court now. Uh, but 
often critics of populist authoritarian critics of, for example, transition countries say, we reject liberalism, by which they usually mean neoliberalism, economic liberalism, and therefore we don't have any time for the rule of law. So what I want to do is say, yes, liberalism of a sort that needs to be unpacked is a very good home to the rule of law because liberal values, particularly liberal liberty, individual liberty, cry out for institutionalized protection. And the rule of law is into that business. But not everything that people call liberal is you don't have to buy that package. And I want to say it's a fairly primitive insight, not necessarily a liberal insight, just a kind of basic human understanding that power, unlimited, unchanneled, unmoderated, can be dangerous for people. You don't have to be a liberal to believe that, though liberals do believe it. And my one of my great or central objections to Marxism, which I mentioned last night, is that it had no theory of breaks. It had no theory of what happens if it goes wrong. What happens if the power that you've you've got is all in your hands and your full of a sense of mission, because the early communists were. We're going to transform, emancipate, liberate the world. So anybody who gets in our way, given that our vision is so clean. Now that, yes, that's, I mean, that's a liberal point of view, but you didn't need liberalism to have that point of view. Edmund Burke, the great, uh, in, in, well, Irish, English, British, uh, politician and political theorist in his famous um, reflections on the revolution in France, he could already sense that too much virtue could be very dangerous. And his reasons for saying that were really conservative reasons. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Be careful how you get there. Make sure you have restraints. You have channels for power. Um, each of my answers is much too long, so I'm stopped. <laughs> no, I think it was uh, just at the right pace. Um, I, I have a question related uh, to democracy. Um, yeah. Some people say that it is the greatest form of governance that people have achieved because it includes so many aspects of liberty, freedom of expression, and so on. But there are people who say that uh, democracy is just a better cover of how the state or how the politics can control people uh, with giving them cert certain freedoms, but, are, but there, are, there are actually more limitations and more controls, like a larger control system to uh, have them under their wing. I've lost you, haven't I? Yep. Did you lose me? Because I lost you for a second. It's okay. Oh, no worries. Wait, yeah. yeah. And uh, my question is, what is your opinion about the future of, um, of a state? Whether democracy will be still um, the, you know, the mostly used uh, system in the world? Or something will shift, shift back to previous existing uh, governance systems or something new will probably develop? Uh, I hardly know what's happening tomorrow in my own personal domestic life. But, uh, the, I mean, these are extraordinarily important issues. Um, I'll try to take a, a couple of steps. I don't, I don't think democracy is always the most effective form of government. Uh, though we don't know, I mean, it's it's it was thought, has been thought, but it was thought by communists. It's certainly thought by the Chinese communists now that their kind of authoritarian, totalitarian regime is more effective. Well, in the case of European communism, that's spectacularly false. We have the evidence. 
Now, one of the things so extraordinary, before your time, but it's in your country, uh, one of the things most extraordinary about the collapse of communism is that no one pushed, just fell. And nobody expected it because it was so powerful, apparently. Um, in the, well, a couple of things. In the 1930s, when fascism looked to be so powerful, after this dramatic, first of all, after the horrific worst world, worst war that the world had ever seen, which was the First World War. And then after that, the Depression. And then the Nazis come into power, but the Soviets are already in power. There were a hell of a lot of intellectuals, in Europe at least, but not only in Europe, who thought this was the last chance, not the last chance, that democracy, or particularly liberal democracy, was really on its last legs. Now, it seems to me that at least at that stage, they were spell proven spectacularly wrong. Of course, it could have been different if, if uh, the Nazis had won the war, we would, you and I would not be talking, having this conversation anyway, We'd be talking about other things. Uh, but that is how it happened. And then uh, the Soviet Union, as your parents certainly saw it, and uh, the satellite states turned out, in terms of effectiveness, to be incredibly grey and drab and unproductive, except in particular spheres which they focused on, like defence. The agriculture was poor, the industrial production was poor. And this is though they had plans, etc. and there are reasons for that. And democracy, because it decentralises power, because it allows for independent initiative, because it encourages that, has a lot, I think, going for it. But where you started was the suggestion, not your suggestion, but the suggestion that you were, you were reporting, that democracy is a fraud in some way. Is that right? Not that I'm not attributing this to you, but... You were sort of Basically, that is what people tend to think, yeah, that it is just an illusion. Again, I think that uh, there are many things that call themselves democracy. And uh, it's one thing to have a vote, but we know that that's not enough. One way, uh, the way that I approach really everything, but it came with the rule of law, uh, what I was saying last night was that my approach to the rule of law is not to start with some institutional set of requirements, criteria, but to say, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And what do you need to deal with that problem? And so the problem I want to say for the rule of law is arbitrary power. And therefore, you need some ways, some of which you can engineer separation of power, some of which are problem, uh, uh, products of long development, um, informal norms, understandings, that in some societies are very deep and in some societies are much shallower, but they seem to be important. So one of the th dramatic uh, things that Donald Trump has shown is if you really don't behave the way the system requires, you can get away with a great deal. It wasn't, and a lot of what he was doing, some of what he was doing and where he failed ultimately was to upturn, to turn over the, or to destroy the institutions. But he was able to unsettle the polity, the political order, just by being the sort of vulgar loudmouth that nobody expected. They didn't, they didn't have rules about that. And, but everyone played the, the, the game that way and suddenly this, this buffhead, sorry, that's in Australia, this, this, he's not, I mean, he's a, he's a dumb genius. Dumb in every respect that really matters except a genius in getting. Now that sort of democracy, you can call it democracy because people vote. I would say, look, 
what are we after in democracy? We want people to um, influence, be able to influence who it is that governs them and to be sufficiently informed about the decisions that they make that their influence is not wild. And so, for me, any democratic system or any system that pretends to be democratic has also to be a rule of law system. Why? Because uh, many of the things that people need to make informed decisions need protection. So in Poland, for example, as you know, the government has completely taken over public media, but a lot of people watch the public media. They are, they've just bought all the regional papers. Now, in circumstances like that, I think not just the rule of law suffers, but democracy suffers. But then we come to your, the hardest part of your question and the one that I am least adequate to answer, and that is, what about tomorrow? Um, Where's this leading? And here, I want to, I think, say that the ideal of democracy still seems to me precious because it involves respect for the people. One thing to talk about effectiveness, but it's another thing to treat people as persons, as people with a voice, a right to be heard with their own problems, which somebody up there either may not know, may not care about. But who are they? You know, when I, I, I mentioned that I'd been involved in Myanmar for some years, since 2013, and I don't know it well. I just go and blah, blah about um, rule of law and stuff. But So I'm not a Myanmar expert, but I've got some familiarity and affection for people and places that I've seen. So when these jerks generals decide that because they've lost the election and because the chief general is 65 and according to the rules, he has to retire, but he's not prepared to retire. They decide just to, to let the tanks roll out. Then not only is it a human tragedy, but I find it deeply offensive. Who are these jerks? In whose name? Who gives what gives them the authority, the right, and I would say that about most autographs. So I want to, it would take a lot of persuading for me to say, look, we tried democracy, it's not doing well, let's throw it out the window. But what I am convinced about is that in 50 years, 100 years, maybe even 30 years, if democracy survives, it's going to look very, very different from the sorts of democracies we have. My objection in, in a lot of my rule of law writing is to people who think or to, that the rule of law is this particular arrangement or that particular arrangement. And for reasons, I don't know if you've read any of my stuff, but I keep it's the same story every time. And there are a lot of times, unfortunately. And to keep saying, it's not just one, uh, bit of apparatus, different places, different times, different circumstances, different problems. You need different ways to honour the ideal. And I'm sure that's true about democracy too. Democracy in the age of internet, social media, has to be different because the sources of information, of opinion formation, are radically transformed. That's just one sliver of things. Uh, the Ability again via new technology to conduct surveillance over citizens is obviously an enormously poten enormous potential threat to democratic values. So we've got to do something about that. So the notion that a democracy is just the sorts of institutions which we use in now or 50 years ago, or whatever, that has to be wrong. But I'm hoping, I would hope that democracy, the ideal, will survive. Because I've not yet, you, you mentioned when you started your question, some people say that democracy is the best form of government, but other people say it's just a fraud. 
Winston Churchill said once, and this is a cliche now, it's been repeated so often, but it's still nice, democracy is the worst sort of government in the world except for all the others. And if you're a kind, if you sort of think uh, utopia is not available to humans except as something to read or dream and to influence perhaps in a positive way, imaginations, nevertheless, we, don't, we will never live in a utopian world. We'll live in a messy world. We'll be surprised. This time last year or a week ago, I was in Brussels imagining I was about to go to a meeting in San Francisco. Three days later, I was at home in quarantine for two weeks uh, because everything had changed. And so we keep being surprised. And it's not the only sort of surprise that we're going to face. You have longer to face than I do. but. Um, it will be surprises. So we can't fix our hopes for an ideal on any particular formation. We have, but we should think seriously, is there something in the ideal uh, worth holding on to? And I think there is in democracy. I think if only some people, uh, in, people, I mean, ordinary people, may not be the best judges of all sorts of complicated things. They're often the best judges or the only ones interested in what hurts them. And somebody interested in what hurts them should have some voice, given that they're there. That's where the buck stops. Yeah. I think uh, what I understood from what you said is that any system, and even specific people, need some kind of a resilience to, to the changes that are coming always and, and to be very vigilant about them and, and to have some kind of a plan. But what to do in situation A, in situation B, if, if uh, you know, technology, technologies have this impact, if, if public health uh, has this kind of an impact. And yeah, I completely agree to what you said, that the ideal is always there. It's, it's the question how to, how to tackle the problems that are arising. But I, what I wanted to, yeah, sorry. No, 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 go on. No, 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 please. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, as there are many illiberal democracies as well as authoritarian regimes around the world, I think an inevitable chicken and egg problem arises. Whether the elite, the power, the, the, the people in power are responsible for enforcing such uh, a rule of law democ democratic system which is not perhaps in their interest but at the same time it's also on the people to start to do something and perhaps their um, in a sense ignorance or some passiv passivity uh, has been at hand uh, to in a sense uh, well incentivize such regimes to even exist and how do you see uh, should these ideas be promoted in, in societies. You, you mentioned that it's very, very specific on context, right? But um, still, to what extent are spe well, people responsible for the systems that are uh, at hand? It is very context specific and yours is a hugely complex, or at least the answer, the question is complex and the answer would have to be complex. Uh, so we know because there are strong historic examples of this, that a powerful elite can exploit passivity among citizens. We know that. I mean, we have so many examples of that. But there is something in the, um, in the notion of the great 19th century political observer, scientist, theorist, uh, de Tocqueville, when he worried, as did John Stuart Mill, about what he called, what Tocqueville called, the tyranny of the majority. And so often, and Hitler was an example, a majority can be whipped up, they're in food, and they're active. Uh, so I think a, a totally passive society is a negative thing. But activity on its own is not always positive. So uh, the context in which Tocqueville worried about it 
comes back to Mata's question about democracy, is he went to America, as everyone knows, and he wrote this extraordinary book, Democracy in America. Why did he do it? Because he he was writing in the mid-19th century. The French Revolution had happened. But France had restored a monarchy, and most European countries were still aristocratic. But he decided, but they were unsettled. The French Revolution had not only affected France, but a kind of ideological ripple effect throughout Europe and was followed by a series of other revolutions in Europe, 1830, 1848, and so on. And he decided democracy is coming. There's no avoiding it. So what I need to do is go to where it's, uh, where it's strongest, where it's newest and strongest, and that's America. And his democracy in America is as much a reflection on European societies as on America. And what he feared was that in, Demer in America, as, aristocrats, as aristocracy gets broken down and people get mobilized, you have a new problem. It was a liberal, but you have a new problem. And that is that majorities will form, everybody is equal to everybody else, majorities will form and threaten minorities. And that was a concern also of John Stuart Mill. Uh, he worried about the tyranny of the majority. And my observation of some of the Central European populist regimes is that this is a deliberate ambition, uh, rhetorical but also real, of, for example, Kaczynski in Poland, uh, which is to call on what he claims the majority believes in order to persecute or to make trouble for uh, minorities, LGBT, Roma in Hungary, and so on. And the paradox, I think, is that I doubt that Kaczynski really cares about LGBT. What he wants... The persecution of minorities is sometimes an indirect or a roundabout way of bringing the majority to you. So you don't care about what happens to them. You don't have the passion that LGBT be ostracized, but you want to use the majority feeling that this is a Western innovation that is inauthentic in Poland, that goes against, unfortunately, I don't have Latvian examples, because I'm not expert on anything Latvian. But on Poland, you see this again and again, that the uh, talking about gay marriage, the talking about, um, about abortion is not because of an intrinsic interest that these are bad things. I don't even know. I have no idea whether Kaczynski or Jobra thinks that they're bad things. But it is to use what is a kind of deformation of democracy, one where liberal restraints are weakened and what you have is not democracy, the encouraging of free opinion formation in the citizenry, but rather a division of the citizenry into those who are ours and those who are not, and a use of the those of who are not in order to draw the support of those who are. For example, refugees. It's the same as LGBT. It's the same function. Uh, does Hungary believe, does Poland, which has almost no refugees except the ones they don't talk about from Eastern Europe, from, from Ukraine and uh, Belarus, they're allowed in. Uh, but they're not called refugees in the same way that Muslims who aren't there are talked about. And this, I believe, is a deformation of democracy and, uh, and a subversion of it. I think... Are, so. uh, yeah, my question is, you are, um, you are more uh, 
an expert when it comes to uh, specifically Poland and uh, the fall of communism uh, in Europe. And my question is, what um, happened uh, in, in Poland, for example, when the communism fall? Uh, because we see that there was a regime change, of course, and uh, I, I believe when, when I have to imagine when a strict regime that have have existed have existed for a longer period of time, there shall be a chaos, uh, a sense of unknowing what is going to happen next. How did Poland deal with the whole situation, and um, how it ended up, in your opinion? Uh, the English writer Timothy Garton Ash, who knows a great deal about Poland, and who is a com combination uh, academic and journalist, and has wrote a great deal of journalism around in the late years of communism, from all the satellite countries, primarily Poland, but he was also in Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Romania and so on. And he said that what happened in 89 is somewhere between a revolution and what he called a revolution, meaning reform. Because except for Romania, no one was killed. Uh, and if you woke up, I mean, we know that what happened in 89 was a world historical change. Everything changed. There's a wonderful phrase, um, which uh, now dead, brilliant American writer, uh, Tony Judd used. He talked about the conceptual geography of the world, conceptual geography of the world. That meant, I mean, you're living in Riga, Riga is Riga, but Latvia is not the Latvian Republic anymore. And the whole, conceptual geography, meaning that all the countries are there, the people are there, actually there are more countries now, uh, but we think of it, everything is rearranged conceptually. So it was a big deal, hugely big deal, but it wasn't a revolution in the French sense or the Russian sense where there was huge fighting, where there was bloodshed, where everybody knew that everything had changed. What happened on the day after was, well, it was many days after before things changed. In that time, it's something I mentioned yesterday and seems to me very important. My answer to your question, your questions are all huge and my answers are all little, <laughs> partial. But, uh, At the world historical level, it looked as though the game which had been played for most of the century was over. That was the competition between totalitarian systems and the only one that existed after 1945 was the Russian and or the Soviet and then the Chinese and uh, their satellites. And even though China survived, it seemed to many people, as we now know wrongly, that China was going to move to converge with the world. Uh, and Russia was just uh, a failure with nuclear weapons. <laughs> so an important failure, but still, it had failed. And so, particularly in Poland, there were, the elites were very committed. They had a very charismatic, brilliant, economist as the first minister for economics, uh, Leszek Pancerowicz. And the notion was central to the transformation had to be transformation to the market economy. I don't understand any, any economics, uh, but it looks like in hard economic terms, in Poland that was a real success because Poland's economy has been so, has grown so fast. But huge, there were huge casualties. Lots of people in the Pegelia or in the in mining districts, which were no longer supported, uh, pensioners, a lot of people suffered. 
and had complaints. And I don't live in Poland. I can't assess every complaint. But what also happened, and Kaczynski's party is the central example of this, but Orban too, is that there were new elites which saw that they could exploit this unhappiness. And here is where the chaos that you mentioned is real. Not that there was chaos of a tangible physical sort, buildings being bombed, people being killed, etc. But there may well have been a psychological chaos for many people disturbance. What do we do now? We don't know the rules. The old rules have gone. We don't understand the new rules. Some people, like people in IT, why is there such good IT in Eastern Europe? Well, smart people who can really get ahead, there's space for them. But a lot of people aren't like that. and They're lost. And then, and this is more speculative, but I've tried to write about it uh, a bit, Long traditions and values in many parts of the world, and particularly in East Central Europe, but probably in the former Soviet Empire, were not, they had no serious democratic experience. And many of their values, inculcated in Poland by the church and in other places by other churches, were not liberal values. They were hostile to liberal values. When the Poles were enthusiastic, as they certainly were, and many of the countries were in 89, for a transformation in the northern, they didn't think that they would be converted, but they'd get to live the way they do in West Germany or Sweden. Uh, and in an excellent book worth reading by the Bulgarian Ivan Krastev and the American who knows uh, Soviet Union, East Europe and Russia very well, Stephen Holmes. The book is called uh, The Light That Failed, A Reckoning. The argument that they raise about East Central Europe is that people were asked to and were very keen to imitate the West. But after a while, imitation becomes unsatisfying. First of all, because there's always the implicit judgment that we're worse. Uh, and that's a big deal, uh, particularly after a long time, particularly when we're not getting better that quickly. Secondly, because the model started to look less attractive. First of all, after the so-called end of history, there was September 11, 2001. So suddenly the ideological com competition had not died. Then there was the financial crisis. Then there was, and I'm sure this had enormous symbolic um, significance, the polarization in America. This is supposed to be the, the light, the, the beacon, but it's not looking so good. And then there was Trump. So a lot of people were disillusioned. And my own speculation, I've written about it, but, and I, I believe it, otherwise I wouldn't have written it, but I... Uh, it's a, it is a sort of conjectural theory. Uh, I mentioned to you that I was very influenced by Philip Selznick, a sociologist, who was one of the great, he was many things, but he began as one of the great organisation theorists in American sociology after the Second World War. And he developed a concept of what he called institutionalization. A lot of people who were writing about bureaucracies or organisations treated them as though it was technical instrument. You should have a, a flowchart diagram of who has this responsibility, who has that. And he says, look, institutions very quickly, if they last, become institutionalised. People develop uh, loyalties, attachments, a sense of mission if it's strong. If you're a Marine, for example, or a member of the church, it's not just like the post office. So people get to feel these attachments. But maybe they don't. Maybe they just, no one tells them to feel the attachment. They don't feel the attachment. He was talking about business organisations, armies, and so on. And I was thinking about Eastern Europe. And my conjecture is that in the enthusiasm 
of the 1990s and later, all sorts of reformers paid no, intent, no attention to the need to institutionalize these new systems. They didn't, they said, well, they've got this, these populations, they were under communist autocracy, and before that, they were under other autocracies. They've got bad values and so on. And we bring them this good stuff, and they will change. There was no real, maybe it would have been impossible to do, I don't know, but there was no real thought about a real challenge for us if we're trying to put new institutions in is to get people to believe in them. Whereas we just throw this stuff out and hope that we they adopt them. And so we didn't have, we, I'm saying I didn't have nothing to do with it, but people who believed my way and actually were active believed that we had recipes, we have institutional procedures, we have ways of doing things. They work for us, they'll work for you. We didn't think, well, maybe people, after all, in many parts of Eastern Europe, no one trusts the state. No one thinks well about law. So why should that all change if you say, well, we've got new state, new law? But the people who did think about this were the Kaczynskis and the Orbans. They realised that value, that this is a fight over values. And they started to say, look, this is not ours. This comes from this polluted, morally distorted, uh, irreligious West with their silly ideas about rule of law, when we know you need a strong state. And I think they uh, found fertile ground for their thoughts. Now, it is a conjecture. It's not scientific. Nothing I do is scientific. Uh, <laughs> and also, a lot of this stuff has happened elsewhere. You know, populism is, is moving around the world. Uh, so this is not a sufficient explanation, but I think it's true. My, my, I think uh, an interesting observation is that, well, of course, in many post-communist states, there were new parties that emerged in the 1990s or in Poland even before, right? Uh, my observation, uh, as also from our discussion before this uh, interview, is that in at least in the Baltic states, many of the political leaders of the 1990s and until even now, have been former communists. They were in the Communist Party, and they were part of that system that we now call, of course, liberal and autocratic. So there is some kind of a contradiction, this dissonance. From one side, these people were part of that regime that is now being condemned. And at the same time, they're the ones that are, well, promoting and building the new regimes. And... Where, how do you see that? Where's the contradiction? Perhaps you see that this is uh, compatible. I think you would have to, and uh, this was one project that I had. I was supposed to be in Vienna last year, I think I mentioned to you. And one thing that I wanted to get back to working on is trying to work out the contexts a bit. I mentioned that I know Hungary and Poland, and in a sense, of course, they're different countries, different languages, etc. Uh, but in the respect that I'm interested, they're like twins. Poland has been copying Hungary, even though Hungary is a small twin, uh, and started earlier, so it's not really a twin. Um, in Poland and Hungary, it's not really like that. Uh, so there were, particularly in Poland, there were new elites. So the ex-communists, particularly in politics, there are all sorts of stories, but you need to get the data on that, how many apparatchiks of the former regime came over, and there was clearly, because no one was shooting them, there had to be a lot of them to stay around, and they start from a better place. The children are educated usually, might have travelled, they've uh, exploited the system, they probably have money, so they're in a better position. But in Poland, there were strong uh, anti-communist elites. They may have been, and I think that's true about some of them, the children of communist parents 
which may have given them some privilege, access, and some sense of security when they became dissidents. But they did become dissidents already in the 70s. So the Polish dissident movement, which was the strongest in anywhere in the world, was some of its leaders, its major leaders, were children of communists, who were not communists already by the mid-70s. And they were the most outspoken anti-communists, people like Kuron, like Michnik. Uh, they were jailed for many, many years. Uh, they were a real counter-elite. And the Polish ex-communists, who to a lot of people's surprise, came back to power for a few years, they're now dis they're, they're, they're not a force. Well, they've got to be pretty old. That's very different in the Balkans, as far as I know, where a lot of the, the continuity is great. And you tell me, but it's not something I know that it's true in the Baltics. Now, that uh, has to be a different story. Uh, and there'll be many different stories, but... The Hungarian and the Polish is not so much because the communists in both, or ex-communists, in both countries are lost politically, maybe not straight after the election, but ultimately the ex-communist um, Orban came back into power after a coalition of ex-communists with some others had collapsed. So here it's a very different thing. But still, I mean, people, people's capacity for hypocrisy and change is huge. So uh, Kaczynski, who makes his fortune, not his fortune, though he may have made a fortune as well, he makes his, his uh, political career out of being a right-wing anti-communist who hates people who had any communist connection, uh, though his father was a communist, um, appoints as his leading figure in parliament, a man called Piotrovich, who was a prosecutor in other communism and in those bad times when they were in the period of martial law, when the the solidarity was put down in 81, December the 13th, and then there were a lot of dissidents which were. Yotrovich was then thrown, oh, not thrown in, uh, elevated to the Constitutional Tribunal. I mean, Kafka couldn't have written something like this. It's just absurd. It's, um, but people, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. It it does show that a lot of well, the innocent way of putting it is that a lot of people just want to make a career. And they don't have they don't make the context in which they live. So if the context is communist, they don't have to be communists, they don't have to be evil people, they have families, they want jobs, and they do that. And then that collapses and they want, they have the same wish, wishes. There's a brilliant book uh, unfortunately, I can't remember it's uh, Socialist Pathways is my guess is the name. It's not a new book, it's quite old by um, an American sociologist called Stark and a, a sociologist at the Central European University, still in Budapest, Lajlo Brust. And the post socialist pathways, it's called. And they make the point, which comes back to several of your earlier questions, that many of us thought in, sorry, I've lost you again. Many of us thought in 1990 that systems have changed. So everybody is thinking about the future. How do I, we're in a transition now, transition to something. How do we become? Success, and they say many, most people, when there's a transformation, look around them and say, "What are, what assets have we got? What can we mobilize for our own present and future?" So, if you were a manager in a communist factory, you look around to the people you dealt with then because you want to e exploit whatever assets you've got. 
So that part of it is natural. I don't think it's unnatural. I completely agree with this. I think that even in that in those regimes, people find themselves and there is always this, the, just this uh, want to, you know, make a living, to, to be of use. And, and perhaps it, it should not be that individual people are, are judged for the context they are they find themselves in but for the actions and the values they, well, they do true yes i i was on a, a listening to a webinar a few days ago with an extraordinary polish investigator of the holocaust of specifically very controversial in poland and she's just been uh, sued for defamation successfully she's an extraordinary historian and extraordinarily brave person. And what she's particularly horrified to discover in her research is um, the amount, it was always a minority, but a much more significant minority than people thought, of Poles who denounced Jews, who killed Jews, who uh, told the Nazis what they were. And somebody said, which is a common response by Poles and has a lot of justification. What about, how does one judge the morality of people who are under a death sentence if they help Jews, who uh, were living in terror themselves, etc.? And she said, the, there is a line of honesty. Turning somebody away, saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you, is still compatible with being an honourable person. Denouncing, uh, murdering, informing, that's on the other side. So I think it's exactly what you said. Somebody may, it depends what agency. I mean, if you're in the secret police, it's a problem in many aspects of the secret police. But if you're just working as a bureaucrat and some communist, as, as most people did in state-owned, in a state-owned country, well, that's that's life. You can't you can't do you can't do otherwise. Well, my last question is, what has been your greatest discovery or conclusion you have come up during these years, um, having made so many researches on communist Europe? What what was you fascinated about? And perhaps something that you have changed your opinion on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm glad. Uh, greatest. I don't make great discoveries. You can name, uh, you know, more than one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing which surprised me hugely. Uh, and that is what I think of as a kind of political amnesia. When I was, when I first, I, you know, my background, uh, so I went to Poland, I was very excited. I met uh, because that was the period in 85 and 89, I met a very sad and grey country with a lot of extraordinary and, to me, hero, heroic people. Uh, and I compared them with my contemporaries. I was always from Australia, particularly if you're young and you don't have any money, uh, a trip has to be a long trip because you can't... You can't go overseas for a weekend. So I, going to Poland, would always tie it together with a research trip to the United States and the other way around. And compared to my contemporaries in the United States or Australia or the West, I thought these people I was meeting, these dissidents, really had a kind of profound moral perceptiveness. They knew what counts. They knew that, for example, as a lot of, at that time in the, in the 1980s and the 70s, a lot of intellectuals in the West thought there was no big deal about freedom of expression, freedom of association, etc. These were bourgeois rights, and they didn't add up to much. Whereas the people I was meeting in Poland knew they added up to a great deal. And they were fighting for exactly those things, and some of them being thrown into prison for years for exactly that fight. And I came across the phrase by the a Polish sociologist whom I mentioned last night, Adam Podgurecki, uh, who ultimately was driven into exile. And he said, look, you get a special insight into the morally important things in public life if your rights are crippled. Uh, 
And I thought, that's it. That's Now, what surprised me is how quickly, it seems to me, people forget that. I mean, you know, the uh, Kaczynski was of that generation. He was not a, he was not the prominent di dissident that he pretends to be now, but he was in that leadership group. He and his brother were. They were on the peripheries of the leaders. They were around, and they were fired if they were hostile to communism, etc. Uh, Or uh, Orban was this charismatic figure. Now that they forget it, power does that to people. Uh, uh, that a population can treat so lightly, and I'm talking about the need to moderate power, the need to protect freedom of association, liberty, et cetera, et cetera, that that can be treated so lightly only a generation after it, everyone knew, or at least lots of people knew, lots, not everyone, that despotism, that uh, a society where people can monopolize the newspapers, monopolize television, et cetera, is in an unhealthy place. So I, that's a real discovery for me, how quickly uh, we forget. And a sort of broader one is um, we often generalized about countries in a way which I think is unhelpful. So. Poland in the 80s was a hero country in the West, all those glamorous, uh, et cetera. And now it's a non-hero country because of the... Now the country's the same. I mean, the people, there's not been a, a atomic bomb. So the changeability, the heroism, that's too much to ask anyway, but decency in public life is not hugely widespread. It needs a lot of support. And it can disappear pretty quickly, it appears. And I think that is, I'm more worried about it. I thought, I think I would, I knew that I, I, there were a lot of people who were pessimists in 1990. I was not. And I think, uh, I think I was naive. So that's a discovery. I mean, now I, I when I listen to your answers, I, I, I managed to go back to what I, when I was doing your readings uh, in one of my courses. And now it's totally different thing to listen to your observations, you know, eye to an eye. Yeah, yeah. and you are explaining why you have made such observations, how you ended up getting into them with the basis on history, on basis of events taking place, on your personal perspective and experiences. And it truly inspires me. And this conversation uh, made me look at things totally from different um, perspective. Yeah, and that's truly amazing. If one conversation can change so much. Martin, <laughs> perhaps there is some kind, something that you would like to emphasize or, or uh, you know, repeat uh, for perhaps future statesmen and statewomen, uh, you know, in, in the Central Eastern Europe, in the Baltics. Or maybe something you would like to say to, uh, you know, our generation yes, um, as future politicians, maybe, or lawyers, what shall we take into account? Ah, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, when I was an anti-communist, when that was a position you could, you had a reason to hold, I was very hostile to power, as I thought. To, um, then I started to be persuaded that power is often... Uh, not a bad thing, and, and uh, that is you need it. And so my whole, the trajectory of writing, my writing about the rule of law changed from saying what we need is to curb, limit, etc., power, 
to say we need to moderate it. We need it to allow it. We need to allow concentrations of power where they're necessary and to do the things that it's necessary to do, build an army, make sure that prison wardens don't kill uh, prisoners, a million other things. But so I think if you're hostile to authoritarianism, which seems to me central to what I believe, then you should realize that it's not power itself that you need to try to destroy, because then you have another range of problems. It's moderation in the exercise of power that you want to encourage. And that's complicated, but it's uh, huge. And you, power is important, power can be valuable, but power is always, always something to worry about. Not to be hostile to, because for the reasons I mentioned, but to worry about, because first of all, I mean, it, it can be stupid and painful if it's not properly channeled and so on. But secondly, it goes to people's heads. One of the things that you see, if you've had a lot of heroes and if you see how many of them have become villains when they get a chance, uh, then I'm, so uh, what I advocate is not a black and white attitude to any things, actually, many things, uh, but the notion that something can be at the same time valuable, important, and always to be concerned about and to be worried about and to try to civilise and tame. And anyway, now I'm sounding like a preacher, so it's probably time to stop. No, it, it totally <laughs> makes sense to me because power, power is something people see, sometimes see as something bad, you know, a limitation to their rights, limitation to who they are and their um, freedoms. But what if it doesn't exist? Uh, what if there was no governance at all? Would the world would be a better place or more dangerous? It's a tool, a very powerful tool. I th yeah, I think it would be both those things. That is, it would be more dangerous and it wouldn't last because someone would pick up the pieces. In fact, Lenin said it very poignantly. When he, was, he had his stroke and he was, he was writing a sort of testament diary, and the whole Marxist project at the time in 1917-1916 was that capitalism had to be built up in Russia. Only then could you have a revolution. So the whole Marxist trajectory didn't say you could have a Russian revolution in 1917. And that wasn't the right Russian line in 1916. Lenin came back into Russia in April and gave a speech at the railway station. He said, we are going for power now. And the other Bolsheviks were amazed. They were surprised and some of them disagreed. In this uh, testament, he says, but what were we could do? What could we do? The power was lying in the streets. We had to pick it up or somebody else would. Literally. And unfortunately, that's the truth. It's truth. If it's lying in the streets, somebody will pick it up. And they exactly. won't pick it up with restraints. Yeah. I mean, it it totally explains whole history of human generation and civil society, because always when there was a chaos and there was no power leading them, there was always one from the society who took charge and became the leader, because people yep. need someone to lead them. They cannot guide themselves within a large group of people. And that's that's power. The power when it's lying on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you need intermediate forces, not necessarily, I mean, law is important, but it's only one of many things. Intermediate sort of blocks of things which get in the way. Uh, Montesquieu, beautifully, he says, it's like water running down sand. It needs stones there to make it uh, disappear. Beautiful. Well put. Thank you, Martin, <laughs> for the interview. I, I hope well, this was insightful thank you. for the listeners. I really think that this, uh, you know, gave a more, well, a broader perspective that law isn't only something that, uh, as I, I think something I said that it's not something only on paper. It's always dependent on context and it is a tool. 
and it always is intertwined with other concepts as power, as ideologies, values, and... Society, people, interactions. Yeah. And I love the interdisciplinary perspective, how you manage to provide to us how law operates with politics and uh, society, governance. And it was very fruitful conversation for me, and I Thank gained a lot. Thank you very much. Well, I enjoyed it too. And I wish you well. And one day, I will be in Riga. I hope so. Thank we you. We would Martin. like to meet with you. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you. Good night. Good, night. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> this episode was developed in collaboration with the webinar series Spring with the Rule of Law in Central and Eastern Europe by the SWPS University of Social Sciences and Humanities.